today what I'm uh, going to share with you is actually a continuation of what Naveen was talking about. I'd like to take from there. But like, I, but I don't want to talk about big data. I want to talk about small data. Um, data in terms of teaching. What is useful for teachers? Right. Um, to help her do her daily or him her daily uh, you know, job of a teacher. Uh, what kind of data is already available? and uh, how are they using that data and what more can we do uh, in terms of that. So today I will be talking about uh, the obvious things in terms of data available in schools for teachers and also the not so obvious uh, things, right? Uh, to start with, uh, I would like you to take a look at this quotation uh, by a political science teacher from England, uh, Kevin Rooney. He said, we must never forget that pupils are not data and teachers are not data managers. I would like to, uh, like to know what you think about it. I hope you can hear me without the mic. You can hear me without the mic? Yeah. Uh, uh, so I would like to know what you think of it. I'm putting on my teacher cap asking um, you to raise your hand if you disagree with this statement. How many of you disagree with this statement? Only one of you. Okay. Thank you so much. So out of uh, all of us in this room, only one of us did agree with it. Um, as an organization, um, talking about this, that we both agree and disagree with this. We agree with it, at the same time we disagree with it. I'll tell you why. I'll, let me give you an example. Uh, what should a school do with a sixth grade student who stopped going to school? Uh, we know of a school where a sixth grader uh, suddenly stopped going to the school, right? And as usual, that school decided to issue TC to the sixth grader who stopped going to the school, right? Nobody in the school asked him why he stopped going to the school. Right? What happened? What is the reason why it happens um, across our school? That's one example. The second example. Because we are an organization that works with teachers, so we often go out uh, to schools, uh, you know, trying to see if they need professional development help, right? Now, the question is, should a school that produces good results consider professional development for its teachers? When I say good results, 100% uh, in the SSLC or the CDSE, should they consider professional development for its teachers? Uh, whenever we go out to, uh, we, we go out to schools, you know, many schools that they say no to professional development because they have, you know, this, they get 100% so everything is good and fine with us so we don't need any more support for our teacher, right? So these are the two obvious things, obvious data points that we have or information that we have in schools. One is the attendance, um, the second one is the school, right? And we rely a lot on both uh, in our schools. Teachers rely a lot on that. A well, third scenario. Um, so we, I'm talking about a school in a metro, um, a, a very established school, a well-known school. Um, so every month, teachers meet with the principal um, to discuss student progress. When I say student progress, we are talking about student progress in terms of uh, if you ask the CBSE school teachers, uh, you know, they will take, you know, they will recognize these two abbreviations that I've used: FA and uh, SA, formative assessment and summative. Assessment. Um, so they discuss that, right? Uh, every every month, teachers meet with to discuss that. Um, but the thing is, they stop there, discussing the what children have scored uh, in the FA or the SA. But if you really have an informal one-on-one uh, -on -one chat with these teachers, uh, you will really know what challenges they face, what challenges students face, uh, you know, in terms of learning, right? But this is not really discussed in the meeting. What kind of challenges students face and as well, what kind of challenges teachers face. And now there is another example that I want to give. Um, again, we know of schools uh, in their ambition to have 10% 100% result uh, that use this data, the test code data, or FA, or formative assessment, or summative assessment, on student progress to weed out this case. By 8th grade, you decide, okay, this kid can fit uh, for the CBSE exam in our school or the ICSE exam in our school. Um, 
he may not make it, so better take him to a school where he can you know, make it. So that's the worst thing we can do. Uh, using this data to weed out kids, that's another thing that uh, schools do. Now, if you look at schools in India, in, in our country, we don't have a culture of using data well. We don't have a culture of using data well. Now, William Thompson, uh, Scottish physicist, said, when you cannot express it in numbers, your knowledge is of a meager and un unsatisfactory kind. How many of you disagree with this? I'm glad that more hands are going up, yeah? Um, sorry. Now, I want to um, tell you what another teacher said, Jennifer Morrison, she's a language art teacher uh, teaching in a high school. She said, numbers are important, but they can't provide educators everything, uh, especially when we are looking for root causes of student learning difficulties. Right, numbers may be important, but for a teacher, there is much more uh, Im important information out there. Now, for a teacher, she will say, what you observe and what you hear is the not so obvious data which will help uh, in improving student learning. Now, what do, what do teachers do with this data once you get this data? That's another problem. Teachers, we observe a lot of things. We, we see a lot of things, we hear a lot of things, we talk to students, but what do we do with this not so obvious things that we see in the classroom or outside the classroom? So, uh, it's, we, we think, we believe that it's very important for teachers to have dialogue with this data, right? Uh, talk with one another about um, what the data reveals and how to build on those revelations. Again, I'm uh, going back to Jennifer Morrison. Uh, because she said something else. The problem is that we frame data as an entity teachers need to meet and engage with rather than as information that rises organically out of teachers work with. So you're going a step further, saying that the data has to rise out of the work that you do with kids. The not so obvious data. Not attendance, not your marks, but what you observe, what you see. Right? And now, um, another question that I want you to uh, think about uh, through the day or tomorrow when, when it comes to using data in education is about value addition. Now, we know that um, students come from different backgrounds, different cultural backgrounds, different financial backgrounds, different family backgrounds. Now, what does a school do? What value addition does a school make in the life of that child that is in the school? That's another question that we need to think about. Right now, we have no way of figuring out um, uh, what value addition the school does, at least in our country. We don't think about it. Uh, if there is 100% result, we think you know, it's all uh, good enough, but uh, what does the school do to help uh, the child move? Usually what happens is, you know, all those who can't do very well are kind of ignored. All those who ha can do well are kind of encouraged and promoted. But what can schools do to uh, improve learning for the learning experiences for these, you know, children who are at the bottom? Uh, what kind of data can help us? Another thing uh, that's not so obvious that we need to think about. Uh, now, I'd like to quickly round up by, uh, as an organization, what we do to help uh, schools uh, to somehow, in a small way, to address this, these issues. Um, First one, we have a project that we do, uh, which is a two-year project, which is called Old School Turnaround. Um, it focuses on uh, helping schools with the value addition. So what we do is uh, improve overall student performance by 20%, and that of students whose performance is at the bottom one-third of the class by 50% by the end of the school year. Help teachers to do that by talking about the not-so-obvious thing, or doing the not-so-obvious thing. Um, and there is something else that we also do uh, to help uh, uh, schools. Uh, we have another project that we do uh, in, in a small way in schools, uh, which is an 18-month intervention uh, that helps schools to listen to children. I was talking about listening to children. Uh, listen to children beyond the academic. Right now, um, even uh, Navin was talking about it initially, we focus on the academics. 
on the mark. Uh, but there is there are things beyond the academy. So what we do through this project is set up listening systems in the school. Right now, what we don't have in schools are listening systems. Right? Everybody, um, no, no people, children don't have a space to talk about what they feel, what they think. Right. So we set up help schools set up that uh, phase using a model called old school ecosystemic model developed by Jenny Mosley in UK. So what we do, we use this data that that schools gather through this uh, listening processes uh, to design whole school behavior policy. That's one way we help schools. But this data can also be used to inform policies made by schools. And if this data can be gathered, it can also um, help policy makers uh, decide policy. So we think uh, it is the not so obvious approach that is uh, always better in school uh, than focusing on numbers. Thank you very much.